The world is changing. Just as electricity transformed almost everything over 100 years ago, AI will do the same according to Andrew Ng. This means also that the future of work is changing. 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030, according to, World Economic Forum, uh, according to World Economic Forum, haven't even been invented yet. And today we're talking about what does this mean for the non-technical talent and for inclusive innovation. Uh, funny that we're talking about non-technical talent because at MIA actually we do not believe there's such a thing as non-technical talent anymore because everybody can and should embrace AI's potential. And we have seen what learning and innovating with AI can lead into, leading to promotions, uh, new jobs, collaboration, and so much more. So we're here harnessing AI's possibilities today in this incredible panel, and I cannot wait to learn from your wisdom and insights. Uh, the future of AI is so much more than the technology. It is actually about the people behind it. So let's go in. Uh, Sade, I would love to start with you. Uh, in your experience at Time, you're the CEO, CMO of Time. Obviously, you are at the forefront of the innovation and, and media. Um, so I will say for Time, it's kind of two prongs. One, the really practical sense of AI and that a lot of these models need information. And what Time does is produce information uh, daily, multiple times a day. And so I think from a just practical sense, um, the news production that time provides sort of is is what part of what's you know filling these models i would say um we decided to take down the paywall last year uh to really you know take a stand for the democratization of information and news so that anyone anywhere could access um time content and um we you know we've experimented on the tech the tech side of building those models that allow you to um really search our content and ask it anything, sort of a la ChatGPT. I think from a brand perspective, what we did is we saw that AI was the number one topic that our readers cared about. Last year, we produced a list for the first time called Time 100 AI. Um, half that list, uh, people of color, uh, 41 women non-binary. Um, and so I think a big part of our responsibility is chronicling what's happening in this space, both the good and the bad. Um, so we've got folks who, someone on our list who, you know, 76 year old who left Google to sort of, um, because he was so dis, um, enchanted with where AI was going. And then you have 18 year olds who see a really bright future for it. So I think that's part of our responsibility um, from the media space is chronicling that. 100%, and thank you for leading the way and doing all the incredible impact in the space. Uh, Punacha, we obviously heard from your incredible co-founder and colleague, but now we want to hear from you. You have co-founded platforms that merge well-being with technology, so can you elaborate how leaders use AI to enhance personal and social well-being, and are there any challenges that you have faced when integrating AI with conscious leadership practices? Thank you, Jenna. I think thank you to Mia and Inkwell. I think Dr. Chopra, I've had over two decades working with him. And we bought meditation with the Oprah Chopra 21-day meditation. But to set the stage, as we sit down here today, the silent pandemic is mental health. Every 40 seconds, we lose someone to suicide globally. In the United States, one of the most powerful countries in the world, every 10 minutes. So there is a silent pandemic. There is not going to be enough therapists. You have to use AI as an intervention. If you look at young adults, the second leading cause of death in the United States among young adults is death by suicide. So I think from the Chopra Foundation, I'm looking at three problems we're trying to tackle. One is mental health, and we have a movement around that. The second is longevity, well-being. The third area of focus is conscious leadership. How can we have, in this amazing time, we're building all this stuff, but the world is pretty much falling apart. So how do we create conscious leaders? So Deepak wrote a book called The Soul of Leadership. So it's not about your LinkedIn profile. I can Google that or search that. But what's your soul profile, right? The four questions, who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? And what am I grateful for? And when you tap into these four questions, as a leader, you make better decisions. So I'm an engineer, and Deepak also loves acronyms. So there is an acronym called LEADERS. If you all remember one thing, L-E-A-D-E-R-S. And in the soul of leadership, we talk about look and listen. 
How do you look and listen within your team? Two is be emotionally bonded. Today, the leaders are not emotionally bonded, right? There's a psychological safety study from Google which talks about psychological safety. A is awareness, D is dream and do, E is empower, responsibility, and synchronicity. So when you actually exhibit these attributes, you become a bit a better leader. So from our perspective, actually, we're building now an AI platform, working with Deepak and my technology partners here, here where we want to actually create Deepak's twin, digitaldeepak.ai, which will be launching on Thursday. After 95 plus books and probably five more, we have the ability now to take all of Dr. Chopra's content and use the IP and the technology to kind of really give you the source content. Today with AI, and everybody talks about AI, but we really start using AI. There's a problem called hallucination. I think everybody knows about it. The beginning and the ending are great, but in the middle it's kind of made up, right? How do we go to the source of the content? So one of the things I feel AI and leadership is going to work is once again the acronym leader, right? L, learning and development. I think today leaders can learn quickly because so much of content available. Where is the right content? The A is looking at efficiency. The E, sorry, E is looking at efficiency and, and, and looking at productivity. Assistance, chatbots, all those kinds of things. The A is analytics. Predictive analytics kind of help you be a better leader, right? D is data-driven decision-making. Right? R is basically looking at risk management, and S is, S is strategic planning. So these are the areas where AI can play an instrumental low role for a leader. 100%. AI can scale all the goodness for us, and I cannot wait to have more of a conversation on Thursday. Uh, please get in touch with Puna Charmi if you want to attend and talk more about AI for Good and the incredible initiative that the Chopra Foundation is launching here at the Can Alliance. Super impactful. Emma, we go into you because you are like working right in it. The Gen AI lead North America for Accenture song. Your role involves pioneering Gen AI use cases. So could you discuss some kind of transformational projects that has reshaped uh, business models? Any like client cases that you're working on or anything that you can share from your work? Of course. And thank you so much uh, for having us. So. Uh, at Accenture Song, we're working with dozens and dozens of clients on like what their Gen AI transformation actually means. Um, and it's different for every company, it's different for every person. Um, I think the most important thing is to decide what it is that you want it to do for you and what you're actually trying to achieve from a business and strategy perspective that Gen AI is going to assist in versus like looking for what the technology currently does and then adapting your business model to that. So we've worked with you know, many different um, companies, but some of the business model innovations that have come out recently, um, I would say that what we've done with Fortune uh, Analytics uh, in applying generative, uh, a generative tool to produce insights from Fortune's database, which is purely Fortune's information. You know, you can, don't forget you can train Gen AI on what you want it to be trained on. These are all human decisions. Um, humans have created all of this technology and they've created the databases and they've created all the rules. So this is not humans versus machines. It, it is one and the same. Um, Fortune have been able to produce a new monetizable um, source of revenue because it, their insights are now more accessible and more actionable for um, strategic decision making. And we've been able to help them kind of produce that in a way that's proprietary to their um, database. Um, we have lots of other examples, but one I really love is uh, the work that our Soco Brazil agency have done with Dove and the beauty campaign. Love the campaign. Yeah. Powerful. <laughs> Extremely beautiful, um, but I think if for anyone here who's experimented with um, generative image tools, uh, you can put in, you know, produce an image of a beautiful woman and something very undiverse and very generic and very blonde and white will, will typically come out uh, of that model. Um, and so the campaign that we've worked on with Dove is really to, like, um, counteract that um, bias uh, that is kind of automatically coming out of these um, models and uh, actually adjust the prompts. So again, the humans are going to provide the prompts to the machine. The machine will give you what you ask it, so be careful what you ask it for. And so with Dove, we actually have appended the, the prompts to say, produce an image of a beautiful woman that aligns with Dove's beauty standards. And you'll, you'll see and go and play with it yourselves if you like, but a, a far more diverse range of, of beautiful 
um, imagery um, being produced. So I think that's a really interesting kind of example. Um, yeah, and we have plenty more. Thank you. That is such a powerful example. And you kind of like scratch the surface on how do you balance innovations with ethical considerations. But can you share anything like how do you balance innovation with privacy and trust as well in the work? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a rather large responsible AI team um, who work as part of Accenture Song and, and Accenture um, in the broader sense. And we feel very strongly that responsible AI should be part of every project, every decision and be embedded into all of the uh, not only strategic principles that companies are making, but the technology decisions that um, companies are making. So we propose that um, Accenture's responsible AI team is a, is a big part of how you're moving forward with Gen AI. From our own research, only 2% of companies who have implemented Gen AI internally in their processes have included responsible standards and practices. That really needs to grow and that's also a human decision. The standards, the principles, the strategies, the output that you agree that Gen AI can produce for you, the processes that change, the jobs that it affects, those are all human decisions that can be made as part of your day-to-day -day business operations. And so being responsible is really just a choice. Um, yeah. Being responsible is a choice. I love it. Uh, let's talk about the importance of inclusive innovation. And this is for all of you. I want to hear from Sade and Anpunacha. How can professionals from non-technical backgrounds collaborate effectively with AI teams to drive uh, innovation? What's your, your experience in that? And as I said earlier, there's no such a thing as non-technical anymore because we all should and can harness AI's potential, but still. Yeah, I think uh, I'm from a very small part of India called Kurugu, Kurg, which is... Uh, we are the last of the Mohicans. And where the, literally there's the Western Ghats where the tigers are disappearing, the king cobras are disappearing, and the villagers, which is my community, are now getting together. And today when, when you got a bite in the forest because of, of the cobra bites or snake bites, you'd basically death sentence, or pretty much in two weeks you're gonna die. Today we're looking at using AI technology to do, do drone delivery of uh, basically to be look at you know injections right so basically you can now save people's lives by basically dropping an injection on the spot so you can actually rescue from king cobra bite so there's a lot of innovation happening now and this is not coming from engineers sitting in google or engineers sitting somewhere else these are farmers who are now going out there the local engineering colleges and saying how do we prevent there's another way in the same town where a lot of people drown and now they're actually in drones to drop uh, what do you call that the uh, the tubes, so people can save themselves. So this is how I think technology and AI is being democratized. But I also believe one danger we have, and I talk about very much, that most of the software engineers today are men. We need more women developing software. And less than 20% of the workforce, even in India, we need more women developing, because empathy, consciousness, it can only come on the person coding, to your point. It is still a human-driven technology. And unless the person driving the tech that doesn't have I always joke, the opposite, I want to build an app, the opposite of Tinder, called Tender, right? Uh -huh. There needs tenderness in technology development. Yeah. So, you know, when, when there's a masculine archetype, high-speed internet, optical networks, number one traffic porn, right? Mobile phone, number one thing, addiction. We are the intersection of AI and blockchain. We need compassion and we need technology to come in that way, conscious technology. Yes, conscious technology, and you said it so well, because I think that the, the title prompt engineer is so misleading, because it is actually prompt designing, it is actually communication, it is actually just asking better questions and, and directing the prompts in a way for, for your desired outcome, and I think who would be better things to do those as women. So, so we need more women in AI, and that is what we are working on and doing at MIA, Mission Impact Academy. Uh, Sade, would you want to add anything about inclusive innovation and how how you see this transformation in, in time and how is the non-technical talent coming together with the technical one? Yeah, I mean, I would say exactly what you, know, you were referring to. We want to put a spotlight on that because I think from a media perspective, when we're able to say this place matters or this, these people and this experience matters, that really inspires both the, the people that we're highlighting and then others to pay attention. And so that's one of the things, a core value at time is really brand trust and being able to cover the stories that we think are you know, windows into the world and what we should be paying attention to. So I think that's our 
place in this um, AI journey. Hundred percent. I want to talk a bit more about future of work in terms of marketing, well-being, and in terms of AI and everything. So, uh, what roles do you see emerging in the intersection of AI in your industries? Let's start about well-being, and then let's go into marketing, and then let's hear from Emma. So, I think from a well-being perspective, first is nourish the body. Only 5% of diseases are what we call fully penetrant gene mutations. If you talk about the four horsemen, you don't need to die of disease anymore. Unless you have the Baraka-1 gene, the famous Angelina Jolie, yes, you need a double mastectomy. Extreme, but you still need it. Now there's CRISPR technology. But if you don't, it's only lifestyle. So I think AI can help you with your lifestyle. Nourish your body, move your body, yes. right? Manage your stress and emotions. Fourth, have a mind-body practice. Fifth is sleep. Sixth is connection with nature, over there, circadian rhythms. And seventh, it's community. It's like intimacy. We are super connected, but very lonely as a, as, you know, you know, as, a, as a society. So I think hopefully you can use tech for good to make us more intimate. And we have a program we are launching, an operating system. As you look at AI, I think there's an operating system which we need, and we call it love and action. Because love without action is meaningless, and action without love is irrelevant. But love in action can change the world. And it's based on four A's, right? The first day is attention, deep listening. Today, people don't listen. You go to Kansas, say, hi, how are you? And then they're only scanning the room for the next person. They can network with. There's a networking disease. So attention. The second A is really appreciation. Only when you have attention, you notice the people. If there's no, people are in a relationship together, but they're lonely. They don't appreciate each other. Only when you have appreciation, the third A is affection, love, kindness, tenderness, compassion. And the fourth A, radical acceptance. And this is where we look at how hopefully AI can help you be a better human. Radical acceptance and then also personalized well-being, what AI can do for you to really, and also personalized learning and personalized marketing and, and, and all of these things. Sade, how about the future of work in terms of marketing? What roles do you see coming and how has your work changed so far? Yeah, I think it allows us to spend less time in the analytics or getting to the analytics. Um, because the access to them has just accelerated um, at obviously a really fast pace with AI. So it allows us to be more creative and spend more time challenging culture and sort of what we want to put out into the world. So I think, you know, from a purely production standpoint, it allows us to get to the heart of what we're, what we're you know, the matter faster. Emma, what about you? So at Accenture Song, and I'll do it for those of you who haven't heard of Accenture Song because we're a very giant company that not a lot of people know exactly what we do, but that's okay. Um, we really focus on client services and consulting focused on the customer and consumer kind of portion of, of business. And so anything from new products that you develop to marketing to service to um, commerce interactions, we kind of look across that whole spectrum. And so I can say that there is not a single role at Accenture Song that will not be impacted by Gen AI, and we expect and are actively training every single person um, in our organization to upskill in a way that means something to them and their skill set and to what their careers, um, the, the way that they plan to develop their own careers. Not only is it important to their um, personal development um, as practitioners, but it's what our clients need as well. And so we're not going to be in a good place to provide um, incredible advice around Jet AI unless we're, um, unless we're highly experienced in it ourselves. There is not a single role that won't be affected by AI. So let's get learning now, and I mean AI is for us all. Uh, let's talk about innovation and sustaining innovation. So, as we know, innovation often comes with a burst of energy, uh, with all the new things, but how do we sustain innovation uh, within our teams and organizations over the long term, especially when incorporating complex technologies like AI, and it's ever evolving and moving, and the technology is so fast. So how do we stay at the forefront of innovation continuously? Emma, maybe you can start, and then we go from there. 
Yeah, absolutely. We really encourage all of our clients to think of innovation as a as a muscle and a permanent part of the way that they operate their business. It's not a one and done um, experiment. It's often, it, although it's often treated that way, oh, I spent a little bit of money on innovation and check, I, I did that. Unless you're taking that innovation, learning from it, learning from the failures, and then incorporating the successes into your business model and into how um, all of your you know, employees operate, then you're, you're missing the value that has been um, produced from that experimentation. And so we think of it as an always on machine, a muscle, a, a whatever kind of you know, analogy you want to use for it. But um, innovation should be the core of what you do. It's how we all grow, as Dr. Chopra mentioned. If you're not growing, you're dying. Um, and that, that goes for businesses as well. Exactly. Yeah, I think, um, you know, DEI, which is very clearly under attack right now, um, is really innovation in action. Um, and I think because you're bringing in multiple perspectives, because you're allowing more folks to sit at the table, that's, that is what drives innovation. And so I think the more that we embrace the fact that, you know, DEI is not, you know, it is a political issue in some arenas, but from a strictly marketing brand revenue growth perspective, it is a path to true growth. And I think the only way that we'll be able to scale these companies, you know, we're under all under a lot of pressure, right, to, to build and to scale. And so I think unless we put that at the center, the different perspectives, the different models, it's, it's just gonna be sort of a, a recycle of what we've seen. So I think DEI and impact is probably the greatest opportunity for AI. The greatest opportunities, yes. I think echoing what Emma and Sadi said, but I think what I would like to also add to it is that the world today has to move away from the very masculine archetype which we have dealt with, right? If you look at the word in business, SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, threat, defeat, decimate, destroy, take the share of the pie, you know, what's the market strategy? I mean, these words are very military. I think the, word need, the world needs more towards a feminine archetype, which is more about caring, sharing, not operating from a place of scarcity consciousness, but abundance consciousness. So redefining boundaries. And I think today, when you look at all the amazing work you all are doing in the organizations, an X factor is also getting people to get to know who they are. The who am I is a very important question. And if you don't understand that one question, there's always a separation, right? And I think if you understand the world where there's no separation, we will not hurt each other. We will do things which will help each other, nurture each other, and raise the vibration. Who am I? Can you just briefly remind us of those four questions? So yeah, we call it the soul profile meditation. Yeah. Every day I get up in the morning, I ask the question, who am I? And Punacha Machaya is just a name, Indian, and then, uh, and then for the rest, male. Then for the rest of the life, you're defending a fictional identity. Right? But who am I at the core of my being? Second, what do I want? What is my purpose? And what am I grateful for? Because these four questions return you to wholeness, holy, you know, well-being. I am so grateful for being on this panel today with you and learning so much uh, from you all incredible leaders. As we are starting to wrap up, what is the one thing you want the C-level leaders, the non-technical talent, the AI enthusiasts to take away from this panel? How can they start to harness AI's potential in their everyday life, but then moreover in their organizations? Let's keep it quite brief, but I want to hear from you all. Emma, please. Just try it. Just go and figure out what it is that's going to make your job and your life better, whether it's writing your grocery list for you or fixing something in your work day. Just go and figure out what that is, because I, I bet you you can find it. And if that's not a tool that's approved, go and petition your boss to get that tool approved and for them to pay for it, because the more <laughs> noise you make about it, the, the more accepted this, this will be. But find the joy that this can bring you, because it will. Just do it and have fun, right? Sade. Yeah, I would say, um, to your point about abundance, the, the, one of the principles of AI is sort of the infinite knowledge that we can produce or create from it. So I think us, you know, as impact leaders, being at the center and just sort of taking ownership that we can produce what we want to see, 
um, I think is a key learning for us, even though, even if it is scary or we don't feel like we understand it, it's, you know, per, you know it's information at the end of the day and we have the power to, to create that. I think it's about not forgetting we're still human beings, not human doings. So practice love and action. Love and action. And our call to action as Mia is that it is never too early or late to start to learn the skills of the future. Actually, the best time is to start today. Also for companies, now is the time to invest in your workforce and make sure that no one is left behind in the AI revolution because you can be so much more productive if you encourage inclusive innovation within your organization and make sure that everybody is learning and having fun on the way. Thank you so much, Inkwell Beach, for having us today. Thank you, the Chopra Foundation. Thank you, Time. Thank you, Accenture Song and the incredible panelists today. Thank you. What an honor.